morning, everyone. Welcome to First Congregational Church of Bellingham, United Church of Christ. My name is Davi. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so good to have you all with us this morning, whether you're uh, here in person in the sanctuary or joining us online uh, on the bigger balcony on Zoom or Facebook. It's just uh, so good to have you all with us in worship. Uh, this is a busy time of year for our church, so I have like a bunch of announcements. So like, if you want to go get a snack or um, whatever you need to do, uh, now's the time. Um, but many of these announcements are joyful ones. Uh, I want to celebrate um, the birth of Kip Yoshikimis, son of Ryder and Melissa, and grandson of Scout and Jack. There's a rose in his honor. He was born just a couple of weeks ago. I assume Scout has baby pictures that she can share. Um, let's see. Uh, I have in my hand this ribbon as a reminder. What is it reminding me of? Oh, yes. So our Advent theme is holding out hope. And so each Sunday we'll be inviting folks who are here in person to bring a piece of ribbon and tie it to one of the groups of trees by the organ there, by the windows there, or up here by the, uh, by the font. Um, as a way of lifting up the things that our hope is grounded in these days. What's keeping you hopeful? What's making you hopeful? What's daring you to dream these days? We'll have some ribbons up on the tables uh, when folks come up for communion, and you're invited to take one of those, uh, hold it for a moment, and tie it to a tree. Um, if you would like to help cut some ribbon for that, come on up after these announcements, and I'll give you some ribbon to cut and some safety scissors. Um, Let's see, but if you are at home, that's what I wanted to say. If you are worshiping with us from home or someplace else, you can just get a little bit of ribbon or string, tie it to a tree near your home, or uh, tie it uh, someplace you'll see it as a marker of the way that community holds hope together. We also invite you to gather um, a little bit of bread and some juice or something else to eat and something else to drink. We'll be celebrating communion later in our service, and I hope that you'll consider joining from home. All right, let's see. Lots going on in our community. Today, after worship, is Christmas presents, uh, which is our annual celebration uh, this time of year. We'll have really fun, like, candy-based crafting in the uh, social hall right across the way there. Uh, if you want to just uh, hang out in the narthex, this little gathering area, at 1130, there'll be uh, carol singing. We'll bring a piano out and everything. Um, so please consider joining that. Uh, and then also if you want a little bit lower key celebration, the going deeper discussion is in the Mount Baker room on the other side of the kitchen. And uh, coffee as usual this morning. Let's see. Oh my goodness. Um, there's some butterflies, origami butterflies in the narthex you may have noticed as you came in. Uh, those are on loan to us from community to community one of the local organizations that does wonderful work supporting farm workers and other immigrant communities. Um, they're working to uh, have a city-funded immigrant rights center in Bellingham, immigrant resources center, excuse me, in Bellingham. If you'd like to be part of that movement or sign the petition, there's a little artist statement behind the butterflies and you can sign on there. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's still a few gift tags left for our holiday joy celebration so that uh, families with um, fewer economic resources can get toys for their kiddos uh, this holiday. Um, you can grab one of those tags and bring back a toy or a gift by Thursday. Um, and if you'd like to volunteer for that, there's still sign-ups available. A couple of slots remaining uh, Friday, Saturday, and Thursday this coming week. <laughs> this, this is the part of announcements where I lose the ability to form coherent sentences, so I apologize for all these other announcements. Um, let's see, we talked about that. Um, Adult forums are continuing. This week is the Children Speak, Wednesday at 7 on Zoom. Um, and speaking of children, next week is our Christmas pageant as part of the Sunday morning service. Uh, if you'd like to be involved, you can talk to Susan or Janet Malley. Uh, let's see, I see Susan back by the children there, and Janet, I saw, there, hi Janet. Um, <laughs> um, Janet's sitting two degrees farther this way than I was used to, and so I couldn't find her at all. Um, and finally, Sunday morning covenant groups, sorry, covenant groups are beginning if you'd like to share your faith in a small group and connect with each other over uh, conversations related to spirituality. Um, there's one starting Sundays coming up and more in January. Susan can connect with that as well. Well, that's plenty. 
There's lots more going on in the life of our church. There's announcements sheets uh, at the welcome desk back there. There's uh, more in our um, Monday mission and Friday emails and all the rest. But uh, let me just share our most important announcement, especially in this season as we uh, prepare for Christmas and the celebration of incarnation. No matter who you are, No matter where you are on life's journey, whatever you carry and bring to this place, whatever you're lacking, you are welcome here. You are God's beloved. Let's join in worship together. Thanks be to God. Our Advent worship, as always, is grounded in the story of the call of Mary, the gathering of outcasts and strangers who make room in a stable for the coming Christ child. And this year we're holding those stories alongside other stories from our biblical tradition. This week we tell the story of Esther, Esther is an amazing tale, the kind told around campfires and family gatherings, a tale surely heard by Mary when she was a young girl. It's the story of Esther, a Jewish girl who becomes the queen, and the Persian emperor who is led into a terrible choice. A villain leads him astray to order the extermination of the Jews in his empire. And so we join the story today when Esther is um, seemingly oblivious to all of this there in the palace. Um, Her uh, cousin and caretaker Mordecai is hearing about these terrible news in the streets. And between them, there's this rich conversation. He tells her, perhaps you think you can avoid this just because you live in the palace. But perhaps also this day is yours. You have perhaps come to this position of power so that you can be an advocate, a champion, so that you can dare to speak truth to power in just such a time as this. As we seek to hold hope in this season, as we wonder what it means to hold out hope in times like these, we gather once again around the story of Esther to see where God is inviting us in. Amen. I apologize. I missed a hymn. Um, so if y'all don't mind waiting till after the hymn, I'm sorry. Sorry, y'all. Um, so we're going to sing the opening hymn, which I jumped ahead of. <laughs>
Here we are on Advent, a time of waiting and preparation. We light candles with ancient meaning and new expectation. Will hope come to us in time when we need it? Does hope wait for us? We light a candle as we hold out hope today. Now is the time of the worship service when we invite children who are here in the room to come down a little bit closer. We have some cushions here in front and children who are joining us in the bigger balcony to come a little bit closer to the screen to pay attention because we have some things to talk about today. Often when I have time with children, I bring things with me. I bring some garden tools or something from the farm. Although there are certain things from the farm they never let me bring, like they wouldn't let me bring a live chicken. And there's some other stuff that I couldn't bring with me when I came. And anyway, today I brought nothing because there are some signs that I want you to help me look for around this room. Some signs that this is a special time. Can you see anything in this room that is a sign of a special time? Yes. The Christmas tree, that's definitely a sign that something special is happening. What else can you see, Miles? Yes, the Advent wreath with two candles lit. That's a definite sign of a special season. Any other signs that you can see? I still didn't hear, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. There's lots of red, which is a Christmas color. What other color do you see? Stellan sees something. Evergreens? Yes, right there on the communion table. What other color do you see lots of? I think Davi, they're wearing some color, and there's some colors on banners. What colors do you see? Right, blue and yellow and right. Uh -huh, and some stars. Well, blue is a very special color for this season. It's a special season in the church called Advent, and blue is one of the colors that reminds us of Advent. And if you look at the blue things up here, you will see that there are lots of different colors of blue. Not just one color of blue, but there's light blue and bright blue and dark blue and all kinds of different colors of blue because that reminds us that there are all different kinds of waiting. And Advent is a season of waiting. And the story that Davi told us about Esther and that will be read, parts of it will be read from the Bible in a little while, is a story written in a language called Hebrew, which has four words for waiting because there are all different kinds of waiting. You know, when you're waiting for something that's really exciting, you can be all kind of excited when you're waiting, like if you're waiting for Christmas. Do you get excited about that? Just when I started to get ready for bed. 
Wow, waiting for a package that was supposed to come at 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock, but it came when just getting ready for bed. Yeah. 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, you have to get the story straight if you're going to tell the story. And Stefan was talking about waiting. Maybe. You know, sometimes when I'm waiting... I'm kind of worried about what I'm waiting for. You know, like when you're waiting to see the doctor and you don't know whether or not you're going to have to get a shot or when you're waiting for something that doesn't seem that good. There's all kinds of waiting. <laughs> There's somebody. He likes shots. Well, I hope you get the ones that are right for you and that the ones that are meant for somebody else go to somebody else anyway. There's all different kinds of waiting, and there's all different kinds of season, and you wanted to say something, too. <gasps> yes, there are Christmas lights there. That's another sign that we are waiting and waiting, and that there are all different kinds of waiting. So it is important for us to remember that a time like this can be a time of all different kinds of waiting. Sometimes you even have to wait to say the things you want to say because I'm just taking too long today. So, we're going to pray. Dear God, we thank you for times of waiting. We hope that you understand that sometimes we get very impatient and sometimes we get a little bit worried and sometimes we don't know how to wait. But we know that it is for a time like this that you are with us. Be with us today as we wait. Amen. Thank you all for sharing in the story. Good morning. My name is Jim Hollander. Uh, I'm new to this church. Uh, Frenchie and I just started attending back in August. And speaking of waiting, I've been waiting almost three years to be in front of a congregation to invite them to participate in the life of a church. It has been a long time and I'm feeling a little bit nervous right now, and I'm very happy for all the support that uh, I'm getting from this congregation and from those who know what's going on, including Davi. <laughs> and uh, one of the cues here is, from where am I drawing hope these days? I was baptized into the UCC and then I discovered the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I've been active in both churches for quite some time. And as a follower of Christ and as a pilgrim, I have often asked myself, what is it that makes a church? Jesus says, when two or three are gathered together, then I will be there among you. Of course, when four or five get gathered together, then they start forming committees. <laughs> and when, uh, when you get a whole bunch gathered together, they get to the point where they can get a building. It is absolutely necessary as a Christian for me to be working with all of you Jesus says to feed the hungry, give comfort to the poor, heal the sick, visit those in prison. I don't have enough room in my life to do all of that myself. I need your help. 
You need my help. That's why I am here, is because with our help, we can maintain this building, we can reach out to the community, we can support each other with what we need. So often I have, and I've done this myself, I've thought of giving as a chore because that's my hard-earned money. That's my indication of what I've done in this world. But I need your help. You need my help. We're all in this together. So whether we're making the sacrifice of just coming here for an hour each Sunday, of giving of our treasures, our talents, like Larry and Barbara's beautiful stained glass there, our money. These are things that keep this church working in the community and doing God's work as well as its own and continuing to be a lighthouse shedding God's light over the community. Amen. Thank you. I invite you to join me now in a time of prayer. You can uh, close your eyes or settle in or whatever um, draws you towards the Spirit, draws you deeper into your own heart.
God, we give thanks for this day and for this season. For the invitation to hold out hope. God, when our hope is parched and dry, we pray that you will come with soothing news, with hopeful touch, with healing for our hearts. And God, when our hope overflows in abundance, in joy, in clarity, we pray that you will help us wield our hope as we and all of your people work for justice together. God, we pray today for those who are on our hearts. Among them, Tina's friend Corber as he recovers from a major car accident, and for her brother as well for continued healing and strengthening but also for all of those who are sick or injured, all of those who wait for healing in hospital or at home. We pray for all of the young people who are sick these days and pray for all of the doctors and nurses and other caregivers who are working to support them, to keep them safe, to bring them healing. God, bring comfort in the midst of exhaustion, bring strength, in the midst of hopelessness, bring love abounding. God, we pray also for the people and places that are on our hearts, that we hold in our bodies. We name them now quietly or out loud. Hear our prayers, O God. God, we pray all these things and the prayers we don't have words for and the prayers that wait deep inside us or come out only in dreams, we pray all of these in the name of hope. Jesus, our sibling, who taught us to pray like this. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not our temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Today's scripture comes from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. This is from the New Revised Standard Translation. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe the Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. Hathach went to, out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and to entreat him for her people. Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a message for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king, Inside the inner court, without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called to come into the king for thirty days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night and day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, and the actions of my life be acceptable to you. 
my rock and my liberator. Amen. So we've got this Esther story. And in it, invitations, I think, for how we might hear the Spirit's call, how we might wrestle with hope in our time. Each of these characters, perhaps their own invitation for moments we might recognize in our time and in our times where God's call suddenly intersects with our own lives and bodies and hope. Maybe you're like Mordecai, sometimes. Mordecai Hmm. Mordecai who doesn't need a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing. Mordecai who sees and hears the baleful news, the terrible threat coming to him and his people. Maybe you've been in that place. You've looked around. You've seen trouble coming. And you've realized... There's nothing I can do. That's a deep and intimate kind of anguish. To face a threat and know that there's nothing to be done. Maybe that explains the sackcloth and the ashes, the fasting and the wailing. But Mordecai is in touch enough with his own hope. I would say he is in touch enough with the Spirit, but Esther is almost unique among the biblical canon in that there's this whole beautiful story about survival and resilience and um, overturning. And God is mentioned nowhere in it. So we are, I think, invited as readers to imagine where the Spirit is. And maybe in that moment, the Spirit is with Mordecai saying, it's true. There's nothing you can do about this. But you know someone who might be able to do something. Keeping dreaming in his hopelessness long enough to remember Esther. So then there's Esther. There in the royal palace, far away from her community, from the people who raised her, wrapped in luxury, but this strange kind of luxury that puts her on display, that objectifies her person. Esther, who has power not because she earned it, but through arbitrary and immoral systems. I don't know if that sounds familiar to any of my fellow white people in the crowd, but I'll say it again in case you missed it. Esther, who has power not because she earned it, but because of arbitrary and immoral systems. And she tells Mordecai, I could go into the king to say, don't kill my people. 
But A, he doesn't know they're my people, and maybe I want to keep it that way. And B, anyone who goes in there without permission gets executed. Unless the king says not to. So it's a big gamble. And I find Mordecai's response so... It's a little too troubling to call it beautiful, but it's certainly compelling. You might think that you'll be safe from the coming violence. But probably not for long. I think about my own position as somebody who has yet to experience the most extreme effects of climate change. I have some luxury. I have some capacity. But if I think that the challenges that affect my siblings elsewhere in the world are not coming for me, then I'm letting my luxury draw me into illusion. And so Esther, like Mordecai, is brave enough or stubborn enough or foolish enough to hold out hope and say, all right, get the people together and pray for me because I'm going to do a thing that I might not live through. And then there's Hathak. Uh, Hathak is not in the VeggieTales version of Esther. Hathak is a eunuch. And eunuch means all kinds of different things in the ancient world, but um, usually it means someone whose gender identity is unusual. So I like Hathak. Hathak can be a messenger because He's the person in this story who can go out to the king's gate and talk to the weirdo in sackcloth and ashes and can go into the palace, into the women's quarters of the palace and talk to Esther. Maybe, maybe, Hathak is just doing his job. But maybe Hathik too is wrapped up in, is drawn in by, is surprised by this invitation to hope. Maybe Hathik sees some kind of common cause with this other group of people who are being marginalized, threatened, maybe destroyed because of just something about them, something about their identity that has become a threat to those in power. Hathik uses his unique position, his queerness, his own kind of privilege to travel between worlds and bring the call of desperate need for help to the one person who might be able to deliver. Maybe in this Advent season or in some other season, you, friends, siblings, beloved of God, will find yourself Hathik, the only one who can step between disparate worlds, the one who can use what's strange about them, what's queer about them as a resource for the community, for those in trouble, even just to carry the message.
maybe in this Advent season or in the days to come, you will find yourself in the place of Esther. Surprised by your power, deeply aware of your own vulnerability, called to wield the little privilege you have to roll the dice, to cast the lot. To get your people together and have them pray for you. And then do what you are most scared to do and most called to do. And maybe in this Advent season or in the coming days, you will be like Mordecai, who looks around and sees what's happening and knows who might be able to help. Because maybe it's your turn to act, and maybe it's your turn to tell your friend, hey, you got to act, and maybe it's just your turn to carry the message. But Spirit will tell you what time it is <laughs> as we hold out hope together. But it's Advent. So I could just talk about Esther, but I'd rather also talk about Mary. Speaking of biblical women who did something dangerous. Speaking of women who found themselves in surprising places, who wielded their own power for the survival and liberation of their communities. After this sermon, we're going to sing um, Canticle of the Turning, which is one of my favorite, maybe my favorite, uh, settings of the Magnificat, the song that Mary sings when she's uh, preparing for the Christ child. I mean, one of the songs, presumably there were others. It's about the way that Jesus' arrival heralds this promise that is hundreds and thousands of years old, running from the creation of the world, through the prophets, through the Esther story, right to this pregnant, probably young woman, probably without a lot of resources, probably in some kind of trouble, Mary. Mary, who, like Mordecai, can look around and see what's happening in the world. If you grew up where Mary grew up, in the time Mary grew up, it didn't take a lot of wisdom to know about the threats to the world, the empire that was breaking your land and your people, and often the bodies that you loved. So maybe Mary's song is Mordecai's cry. Perhaps this is the moment. Perhaps we have come to the place. Perhaps you have come to the place where you are for just such a time as this. And maybe Mary's song is Esther's song. Wrestling with power and vulnerability, with faith in the midst of hopelessness, with a willingness to risk one's own life and body for this deep and intimate hope for one's people. Or maybe Mary is havoc in the story because God's been calling you day after day and year after year. And 
and you've been listening to the Spirit sometimes and not others, but Mary has this song that will make it clear that this is not really just about Esther or Mordecai or Hathak. It's not really just about Mary or Joseph or the Magi. Mary, who can use her particular strangeness to call out through history, across oceans, right into this room. And we'll sing the song together, and maybe that'll call you. And if you hear Mary's cry and you don't know what she's saying, that's all right. Because the next invitation might just be to come and have some bread and juice and see what happens from there. Thanks be to God. Amen. Till the 
spear and rod can be brushed by God who is turning the world around. My heart shall sing till the day you bring that the fires of your justice turn. Wipe away all tears for the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. We come now to the time to celebrate communion together. Whether you're here in person or at home, whatever you have to gather around, food or beverage, you are welcome at this table, which is God's table. Um, if you're here in person, we invite you to leave your pews uh, via the like left-hand side aisle. Um, is what we, that's right, okay. Um, and then uh, come up, um, there's, um, regular bread and gluten-free bread, um, and then there's juice in the middle. You're also invited to take a ribbon to hold hope with. You can hold on to it, you can take it home, you can tie it around your finger, or you can tie it around one of these sets of trees uh, here. Um, there was a ribbon, um, <laughs> there was a ribbon, there was a Miss Ribbon occasion. There was, I, I didn't get enough ribbon today, so uh, I think I cut enough for everybody, but if not, there's a little ribbon bin right there. You can choose your own color. Um, and if you have something at home, feel free to, to join in that way. Uh, if you'd rather uh, not be on camera, or if you'd otherwise rather receive communion while seated, uh, you're welcome to just stay where you are. Scout and I will come around with little plates and serve whoever uh, wants ribbons or the meal brought to them. You know, on the day before Jesus was arrested, on the day before they executed him, he did something kind of similar to what Esther did when she said, call all the people together and pray for me. He got his friends together around a table for a meal. And in the midst of the meal, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. When the supper was over, he took the cup of wine and he blessed it. And he gave thanks to God. And he said something like, this cup is my blood poured out for you. This is hope that you can taste. And so we too are invited with all people in all times and in all places, when we eat and drink to remember Jesus, to hold out hope in this special and embodied and intimate and transforming way. Nothing can stop you from coming to this table because it's not our table. 
The table belongs to God, and so it's for whoever wants it. May God bless this meal for you, that it would be sustenance in the midst of hopelessness. That it would be nourishment in the midst of long journey. And that it would be a taste and reminder of the depth of God's love for you. Amen. The meal is ready and you are invited to come receive.
May God send us ready for hope. For the kind of hope that stirs us to know who we need to call. For the kind of hope that challenges us, us to do that brave thing. For the kind of hope that brings us across boundaries, that calls us into stories, that wraps us in God's love. Send us, God, in hope. Amen.